This morning, 50 days from the primary elections, and we are focusing on the Texas Democrats running for Lieutenant Governor. State Rep. Michelle Beckley, Dr. Carla Braley, and Mike Collier all taking our questions on the program. Republicans running for governor are still looking for momentum to catch up to Greg Abbott. We'll look at their strategies as we close in on March. Remembering the January 6th insurrection, the specter of Donald Trump has hung over the last few days. Just how influential are Trump's endorsements now in the Texas primary? And Governor Abbott says he can guarantee no more power outages, but a drop in natural gas production is creating new concern. Inside Texas Politics with Jason Whiteley starts now. Good Sunday morning from a temporary home for our program. Lots to get to, so let's begin with some of the top political headlines here in Texas. First up, a revealing story in the Texas Tribune. On the anniversary of the January 6th insurrection, the Texas Tribune contacted Senator Ted Cruz and 16 other members of Congress from Texas who all refused to certify the 2020 election. The question was whether Cruz and any of those others now accept those results today as legitimate. The Tribune says not one single lawmaker, Republican lawmaker, would answer the question. In case you missed it, the Texas audit from the November 2020 election showed very few discrepancies. It was a spot check of ballots in two Democratic counties and two Republican counties. Next up, the state will physically inspect those election records. A new law now requires the state to audit election results in four randomly selected counties every two years. And Texas Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick has resumed his public schedule. A little more than a week ago, Patrick tested positive for COVID. His campaign said he had mild symptoms and has since tested negative. Patrick completed quarantine on Thursday and is now back at work. Over the next few weeks, we will start focusing on some big primary races in each party. First up today are the Democrats running to replace Dan Patrick. You know, Lieutenant Governor is the second highest political job in Texas and arguably the most influential because that person will decide which legislation lives and dies. All three Democratic candidates are on the program with us this morning, and we are going alphabetically, beginning with State Rep. Michelle Beckley from North Texas. Representative Beckley, welcome back to our program. Let's talk about this office you're running for. The Lieutenant Governor presides over the Senate. You have not served in the Senate. You've never been elected to statewide office. Why do you think you are qualified for this position? Well, I have um, flipped a state house seat, and I have worked in the Texas legislature. I am the only candidate that is running statewide that has worked in Austin in the legislature as an elected official. Um, so I can get in there and hit the ground running. I have staff that are, you know, familiar with the building. And, you know, being a Democrat, if we flip a statewide office, it's going to be a challenge. The way the redistricting is, we're going to have a Republican Senate and a Republican House. You need somebody with a strong personality that's willing to stand their ground, but also work across the aisle. We are going to have to work across the aisle. I have proven ability to do that. I did get my legislative priority in the elections bill, um, which was vote centers for Denton County on um, statewide. It was it really a very boring piece of legislature that was just fixing the statute, which is what elections should be. Um, but I got it in that bill. So Denton County has, a, you know, they're going to get uh, election day vote centers and um, about 70 other counties can now apply as well. If elected to the state's number two position, though, what would your top two priorities be? You know, it, it's still going to be uh, taking the Medicaid expansion, seeing what we can do on that and what variation. I've filed bills that any variation that we can, especially we really need to stop the uh, closure of the rural hospitals. We really need to stop that. That needs to, and then we need to start reopening rural, rural hospitals and the Medicaid expansion is one way to do that. So, you know, if we can't take the whole shebang, I'm willing to work at whatever way we can chip away. And I've got bills that I filed um, that, that actually do that. So we can let counties have the option. There's all kinds of ways we can work with that. Representative, you have been labeled as the most liberal member of the Texas House. Is, is that accurate? Is that something that you wear proudly? Well, you know, I do vote Democratic platform. I will admit that. But I'm a small business owner that wants better health care. And we're going to come back to health care because we are at the bottom of the barrel in Texas. And as a wealthy state, we should not be. We should have um, most of our people should be um, 
they should have some form of health care, high quality health care. Um, I, I don't think that's accurate at all. I think it's just another way the Republicans like to label me. They want to label me. They see me as a threat. The former speaker called me vile and heinous for beating his friend, being outspent 10 to 1 in 2018 when I flipped a state house district uh, from red to blue. And then, um, you know, I was cracked. They cracked 13 precincts around my house so that I am no longer in the district that I currently represent. I do not live in it. Yet my business and my parents who are a mile away are in that district. Uh, last question. You're, you're certainly known in your district representative, but you're not known across the state. Since, since announcing your run for this position, what have you done to get your name out across Texas to the far, you know, far corners that people may not, where people may not, may not know you? Can you get that out here this morning? Sure. Yeah. Like we had a great launch. Um, I have a great PR firm that's helping where, you know, P PR people that are helping me, which is what we're going to need statewide. You're going to have to be in every major newspaper, every major, you know, like I'm, I'm talking with you. Um, that's really what you have to do. Democrats. Have you been Democrats, on the road yet? Have you been on the road yet to other? Not Republicans? yet, but, you know, as a state legislature, I have been. Really, I came in late. I was asked to run when the polling came out of the two former contenders that one of them's dropped out since then. Right. Their polling is so low that people ask, and also as an elected official, I am the only Democrat elected official in the state house that is running statewide. And so um, I do think that does brings a level of experience that none of the other candidates actually have. Representative, thank you so much for the time and good luck to you. Thank you very much. Let's widen out for a moment from that coverage and discuss one pressing issue here, the Texas electric grid. The governor said he can, quote, guarantee no more widespread power outages, but we saw natural gas production drop during a cold wave recently, and all of that is creating brand new concern because natural gas is what fuels so many of the power plants in this state. Ross Ramsey has his fingers crossed, like the rest of us, that we can get through the winter without any problems. He's a co-founder and executive editor of the Texas Tribune in Austin. Ross, good morning to you. Good morning, Jason. How are you? We're doing well here in Dallas. You know, the governor says it will be fine. Energy experts say we remain at risk. And now this drop in natural gas supply is making some people a little cautious. This is the kind of dip in natural gas supply we wouldn't have even noticed last year. This may go on every winter and Texans just go blithely along with their business. But after the polar vortex and the blackouts last February, everybody's nervous about it. A lot of people in the electric industry, in the energy business are saying that the state isn't completely fortified against another occurrence. And like you said, we've all got our fingers crossed. Indeed so, and winter goes until March 20th too, if you're keeping track of that. You know, Republicans are trying to increase turnout in South Texas where they've been making some gains over the past few cycles. What are you expecting to see? I expect them to see some incremental gains. You know, in the last election they saw in some cases, Republicans won in counties where they've never won before. In other cases, the Democrats won by less than they've won before. The Governor Abbott and other Republicans are trying to capitalize on this. He's been in South mm -hmm. Texas uh, for the end of last week into yesterday and uh, announced his campaign down there. I think they're going to really focus on it. All right, Ross, we'll be back to you in just a moment. Thank you. Coming up, our coverage continues with Texas Democrats running for lieutenant governor. We'll speak to Dr. Carla Braley and Mike Collier there in just a moment. And Republicans running for governor are still looking for momentum to catch up to Greg Abbott. We'll look at their strategies as we close in on March. Welcome back to Inside Texas Politics. Let's resume now with our coverage of the Democrats running for lieutenant governor. The next candidate alphabetically is Dr. Carla Braley. She teaches at Texas Southern University in Houston and served as the vice chair of the Texas Democratic Party. Dr. Braley, welcome back to our program. Uh, let's start with an obvious question a lot of people might have here. You, you've served as the vice chair, the second position in, in the uh, Texas Democratic Party. You have run for city council there in Houston. Running for lieutenant governor seems like quite a jump considering you have never held elected office before. How did you decide on this race? Well, Jason, um, for the past, you know, five, three and a half years, I've been serving as vice chair of the Texas Democratic Party. I've traveled all along um, this state, across the state, uh, doing the work already. Um, and the relationships that I have uh, acquired uh, through listening and working with several constituencies on the ground through grassroots leaders, uh, this is the right time um, and needs the right leadership to run. And so uh, I'm running for Lieutenant Governor today. 
Well, well, running or working inside a state party is one thing, but, uh, you know, for people who aren't Democrats, might be independents or Republicans in this state, how would you represent everyone? Uh, well, I, I actually believe that whatever we do as public servants, we represent all Texans um, at all times. Um, and when we um, really put people at the center of, of policy and we put people, you know, right there where we're listening and to what issues that matter most to them, that's what we do. That's how you do it. If, if elected, Dr. Braley, what are uh, your top two priorities? Oh, wow. Uh, you know, our priorities really is to really serve all Texans. I mean, we're going through it, um, not only in the nation, but when we, you know, primarily look at Texas, I mean, when we look at the heartbeat bill, when we look at employment, when we look at what we're going through right now in education and um, particularly what COVID um, is the impact that it's having, all of those issues matters uh, to Texans. I mean, and quite frankly, Jason, you know, we're very large um, in Texas. And so we have rural, we have suburban, we have urban. And at the end of the day, all of our Texans um, are having a number of issues, but been an educator for 20 plus years. So we know that education is certainly key. Uh, uh, you know, great late Barbara Jordan once said that, you know, education is the key to economic and political empowerment. And so when you talk about, you know, two priorities, I think there are a number of priorities, but we're ready to, to you know, address those matters that are most concerning to, to Texans across the state. Is there anything specific, though, that tops that list? You know, um, education, the power grid, I mean, you know, those those issues matter. Education, the power grid, health care, and not just health care, Jason, but, but affordable health care, accessible health care, and not just education, but a high quality education and a an in high quality inclusive education where we're meeting all Texans where they are and including you know, their, you know, various backgrounds and ways that they can see themselves um, and how they study. So, well, here, here's the last question I have for you, too. You're, you're obviously running against a state representative who's also on our program. And then another person who's already been around the track once, Mike Collier as well. How do you plan on breaking out? Well, you know, Jason, this election is so much more. Uh, it's, it's about the election, but it's really about move, building a movement across the state, listening to all Texans. And that's what I've been doing already for the past three and a half years. Um, I'm not new to Texas and Texas is not new to me. And I'm so glad that we're joining together to, you know, to make this run for Lieutenant Governor. Uh, it's, it's about listening and, and that's what's gonna matter. And people know that I do that. Dr. Braley, thanks so much for the time and good luck to you. Oh, thank you so much, Jason. The third and final candidate on the ballot, the Democratic ballot for Lieutenant Governor is Mike Collier. He ran against incumbent Dan Patrick four years ago, and of the 8 million votes cast in that race, Collier came within 400,000 votes of winning. He is now hoping for a rematch in November. Mr. Collier, welcome back to our program. Uh, I want to start with a question that I asked your primary opponents as well. The, the lieutenant governor, as you well know, presides over the Senate. You, you have never served in the Senate. You've never been elected to statewide office or any office for that matter. Why do you think you're qualified for this position? Oh, I think Texans find that very attractive. I think the real skill that we need in the lieutenant governor, in my opinion, is the ability to set the right agenda for the state and then to start solving these problems with a really quite complex. The property tax problem is complicated. Fixing the grid is complicated. Uh, finding permanent funding uh, education, ed funding for education is complicated. The politics of getting people to agree to expand Medicaid is complicated. I think that's the skill that we need. The, the parliamentarian part, I'll have help. That's easy compared to fixing the damn grid. And you have talked about fixing the grid and property taxes as two of your main things. But in a recent UT uh, Texas Tribune poll, it showed the uh, under favorability that 63 percent of Texans don't know who you are, or don't have an opinion on you. And a very similar amount also didn't have an opinion on who they'd vote for in this race. Well, why aren't you any more well known considering how hard you've been working from 2018 to today? It's a big state. There's no other way to describe it. It's a big state. Imagine how those numbers would look if I hadn't been working uh, and, you know, to help Democrats win, to help myself. No, it's, it's a very large state. Uh, I think that's very important in terms of electability, Jason. Um, uh, I have pieced together an infrastructure uh, around the state, and I have folks that are helping me in just about every major city, every corner of the state. That's so important. 
um, because it's been so long since a Democrat has won statewide, a candidate has to build his or her own, and it takes years. So, uh, so I, you know, we have work to do. There's no question. We're going to travel. We have traveled. We've been out 8,000 miles already. Uh, we're just getting warmed up. But I do have the infrastructure, and I have the know-how, and we'll have the resources, and we'll be able to make sure that people make a good decision, and that's what this is all about. I want to ask you briefly about property taxes as well, too. How in the world do you lower property taxes when the property values are just skyrocketing all over Texas? The key is to make the system fair again. The owners of large commercial and industrial properties are not paying on inflated appraisals. In fact, they're paying on under appraised values, which we all know. And so the problem is to solve the property tax problem, we must deal with it honestly. We have to deal with the state not collecting taxes from the owners of large commercial industrial properties. Otherwise, they are just mocking us, Jason. Fundraising numbers are uh, expected out soon. What should we expect from your campaign for the uh, fourth quarter of 2021? Well, I'm not allowed to tell you what the number is until the final accounting is done, Jason, and that'll be released. I'll just say that we're very, very pleased with fundraising. You'll see that it's a multiple, many times where we were at this point in the election cycle. Four years ago, I came very close uh, to beating Dan Patrick on a shoestring budget. You'll see in a matter of days, this is not a shoestring budget. Fundraising is going very, very well. More than 10,000 individual Texans are contributing. And importantly, Jason, I have a strong enough and deep enough network of donors that I'm not going to take any money from the corporate PACs. Well, you, you got within 400,000 votes in 2018. With more money now, how will your campaign be different? I think it will be a much more sophisticated operation, Jason, so we have a much better idea of where the voters are, how they're responding to me. You know, it's a big state. It's a complicated state. What, what people are looking for in their leadership in the Panhandle, for example, is very different than what they're looking for in terms of leadership in the Rio Grande Valley. Uh, so it takes a large staff. Uh, it takes a lot of helpers. And then it takes money so that you can communicate effectively using the various modalities that are available to you, whether it's digital. You know, last time our campaign was uh, almost exclusively digital because it's efficient. This time we'll have the resources to layer in other communication techniques tailored specifically to the folks that we're going out and seeing. It'll be a very different, very different operation. All right, Mike, thank you so much for the time and good luck to you. Thank you very much, Jason. Coming up, Republicans running for Texas governor are looking for any momentum to catch up to Greg Abbott. And are Donald Trump's endorsements really carrying any weight so far in the Texas primary? Those are two questions we will discuss next on the round. Time now for Reporters Roundtable to put the headlines in perspective. Ross Ramsey is back with us from the Texas Tribune in Austin. Bud Kennedy is here from the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. And Bernadine Steptoe is a political producer at WFAA in Dallas and joins us each week for this segment. Ross, we'll start with you. We just saw the coverage and the uh, ceremonies for the January 6th insurrection the other day, uh, which was inspired by former President Trump and his uh, supporters. Considering that, what is the weight of President Trump's endorsements now in the Texas primary? You know, I think he's still the most popular Republican in the party nationally and the most popular Republican in Texas. And I think anyone who actually crosses him is probably in trouble. Not getting his endorsement might not kill people. We'll have to watch a couple of races to see if his endorsement has the most weight or somebody else's. There was one race last time that uh, he and Rick Perry were on opposite sides. Perry won that. It didn't seem to put a dent in the president. Yeah, that's a good point that, that Ross makes, Bud, because everyone seems to, every Republican seems to want the president's endorsement, former president's endorsement, but is it doing any good so far? I don't think anybody's afraid to endorse against him, and particularly in the agriculture commissioner's race where uh, people seem to be piling in for James White against Sid Miller, who was, you know, one of Trump's uh, big campaigners uh, you know, when he ran for president. I, mean, I, I don't know that the Trump endorsement is carrying that much weight. Bernadine, what do you think? Well, we really won't know until election night, but um, every, the candidates are trying to get it. So they apparently feel that he has some kind of weight or influence in the party, but we really won't know until election night just how much influence he has, but he is very popular. Yeah, he does remain that. And nationwide. Right, and election night's, what, 50, 51 days away now until March 1st. But I want to ask you about the Republicans campaigning against uh, Greg Abbott for the Republican nomination for governor. None of them have really seemed to, 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 caught, you know, to catch on so far and have really caught any momentum. Uh, why not? And this is not really what polls are, I mean, this is what polls are saying, not really a surprise to some people. Well, you know, they're really not that well known to the general populace. You know, well, certainly known within the party, but 
you know, and Don Huff finds consistently very little known statewide. When you uh, have to run an ad saying that if you win, there'll be prayer back in schools and the Cowboys will win the Super Bowl, I'm not sure how that plays for people in Houston, Jason. Uh, Houston with the Texans or San Antonio Bernardine or in Austin or anywhere else, right? <laughs> right. Um, but anyway, keep in mind, too, that there is, there is so much news going on that they're not going to get a lot of free publicity in terms of television coverage, radio coverage, primarily because you still have the pandemic. But the only one who seems to have money other than Abbott is Huffines. So uh, we'll just have to see how that goes. Yeah. And Ross Huffines and Abbott are both on television now with ads. Uh, do, do you think that any of that might close the gap with them? Because polls are still showing uh, Governor Abbott way out in front of his opponents. All the challengers have to depend on dissatisfaction with Governor Abbott and all the dissatisfaction with Governor Abbott's on the Democratic side. Those people aren't going to vote in a Republican primary. So they've got to figure out a way to get Republican voters not only to know them, but to decide to vote against Greg Abbott. And I think that's a pretty big hill to climb. And then the, I guess final question, the final moments here too, is any idea which way independents are gonna swing? You guys have done a lot of polling. Right now, the independents are swinging toward the governor, but I think that group is gonna be in play as we go into November. Yeah, still, still a lot of time left for that too. Guys, thank you so much, we appreciate that. Thank you for watching as well. We're back again next Sunday to take you inside Texas politics and hope you can join us in. Until we see you, have a great weekend.